you're going to find out that stance is going to be to your detriment at the wrong time. Marty, you know, what we're talking about, and you listen to what Todd just said, the proper application of using the technique lone kimono. Are we failing to see these, these, these really basic fundamentals that should be applied? I mean, you, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, I agree with, with uh, what Mr. Jurgen said. You know, we need to really stress on the proper body mechanics on how to do it. And, and then after we show them how to do it, then we start putting them in that position and have the attacker change up on that position a little bit to throw the person that's doing the attack off. And the reason I say that, we're going in such a pristine environment. And I understand we have to do the ideal phase to get them an idea on how to move. But I think that that next part up on that learning triangle we go to is uh, the competitive where we start adding a little bit more heat to it, turn the angle a little bit, and, and it starts utilizing the footwork more. You start learning how to zone better and start utilizing your mechanics to put yourself back in the proper alignment. And I think so many times we sit there and we see a student doing a technique and they freeze up and they say, oh gosh, I got to do it again. It's like I talked to a, a United Airlines pilot and, uh, and I told him, I said, hey, what if something goes on up there? And I said, you start going out of control. He says, there's one thing we do. How fast can you recover? And that's the same thing in our martial arts. If you're able to recover and read it, and sometimes we're going to be reading that by Braille. I mean, you're going to be feeling it and moving along with that. Uh, but I am in, in total agreement with the need to get that information across. As far as the low stances go, anything will work if you can pull it off. I see a lot of guys getting down. We're limiting it to just looking at Kempo where we keep into a, a a uh, heel toe depth on it. I get it. I've seen Salat guys go down to the ground and they could spring up for yards, it seems like, and still be effective. I see Shotokan guys I've fought with before and, and played with. Their movements are phenomenal. Uh, I think if you practice it and you work at it, you're able to utilize it properly. So to, to say it's, it's not that good and you're going to lose it down the road, it's the same thing. You know, how well do you practice it? Are you really in tune with it? And if you can pull it off, you know, your success ratio just went up. So well, you're also looking at the exception rather than the rule. I mean, there's a reason. People I'm looking come in at there. the, not the exception in Kempo. It would be the exception. Right. I'm looking in the martial arts community and we're limiting our thoughts just to Kempo. And I'm telling you, there's a ton more of martial arts out there and they do a lot of different things that we don't take in consideration because we get stuck in our own little world here. Sure. You know, and, and, and I think that's that's detrimental. I, I believe in what Guru Insano always says. He says, you should study with as many instructors as you can to get a better understanding of other arts. So it's not going to be a surprise to you and you can start adapting to it. And once you get that that adaption, you know, mindset, I think it's going to let you grow, you know, at a faster rate. Uh, Lee. Is Ma is Marty uh, blurring the lines there for us? With that no. response? <clears throat> no, because, uh, you know, Ed Parker told us the same thing, told me the same thing. He said, I want you to look at these other arts so they don't get, you don't get taken by surprise. And we teach our stances a particular way for a given set of reasons. Um, we're a little bit unusual, in particular with a forward bow stance, because we've got our front foot turned in, our back foot straight, where most systems, it's the exact opposite. And... Uh, I was told in, in a fencing class, they, because I had a tendency when I did my lunge to do a forward bow instead of what you know they might call a forward lean stance in a karate system. And the instructor proceeded to tell me the reason I didn't want to do that was because I would screw up my knees. I said, well, somebody should have told me that 40 years ago. Because it hasn't screwed up my knees and it's because of the proper body mechanics. This is something that I, I tell instructors and students along the way is you need to look at the transitions in the movements to make sure the mechanics are proper because constant repetition is not good for the joints and improper execution, which is what Mr. Durgan was saying as well there. I've taught plenty of seminars where I've had medical personnel come up and say, you are exactly right about how that works and what that does and what can happen. 
You and I were talking earlier, Leah, one of that we probably all of us have encountered is the problem with our students bending their legs, bending their knees, keeping that proper stand. I, I came across something you wrote, which is very interesting, and I think you should expand on it. Why don't you ex- address that issue of the use of the ankle, and you learned that from somebody in Tai Chi. I did. I learned it from a Tai Chi fighter. Um, a lot of Tai Chi people I've, read, I've met over the years, they're, they're not fighters. When I met him, one of the first things out of his mouth was, if you can't do a sidekick, you don't do Tai Chi. And I'm sure a lot of Tai Chi people would not want to hear that. But uh, Bob was a proven fighter and uh, was a top student under Professor Cheng Man Cheng of the uh, Young System. And uh, also worked with William Chen out of New York, who was known as the, one of the Tai Chi fighters, who taught um, Josh Waitskin. And Josh Waitskin was the person, he was the chess player that they made the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer. And what's that got to do with anything is because once he became the world champion in chess, he stumbled into a Tai Chi school with William Chen in New York City and eventually got good enough to win the world championships in the combative aspect of Tai Chi. So, um, where was I going with this? The use of the bed, uh, the ankle. Oh, okay. So Bob comes in and he says, um, okay, if you don't know how to do a sidekick, you're not doing Tai Chi. And as he starts to teach this seminar, he says, when you go into what they call a forward bow stance, which is with the front foot straight and the back foot on the 45 degree angle, he said, don't think about pushing your knee forward. He says, think about flexing your ankle. And when you flex the ankle, he says, because they're all connected, of course, flexing the ankle will automatically bring the knee forward. So it's reversing the idea. And Ed Parker taught us opposites in reverse for every move, concept, principle, and definition. So if you can bend your knee, you can flex your ankle. So I tried it. I said, boy, it feels different. And it's a lesson that I learned a long time ago and in teaching. If you can't get somebody to do something one way, you try another way. It might be that you can't get your student to bend their knees over their insteps and push their knees out to the side. Maybe you try telling them to flex their ankles. Or you tell an instructor, so now try this and look at this procedure and see how that feels. Because it does feel different. Let's go to our scientist, Todd, your that's, thoughts. That's interesting because um, years and years ago, of all the people to learn it from, I got this uh, Tai Chi exercise, uh, pushing hands exercise, uh, kind of a different thing from uh, from my Okinawan Kempo Karate instructor. It was the hardest style that I ever cared to learn or train in. Um, <laughs> he, was a, he was a brutal gentleman. He was in the military, Marine. He trained over in Okinawa. Uh, anyway, um, so we had some pretty heavy training exercises, but one of the things that we did and that I use to this day, in fact, for my students is that, is that, is that pushing hands and, and it basically you're coming back and forth and back and forth and you're rocking and, and, uh, rolling on those ankles and rocking back on the heel and forward and then flexing that ankle like you're talking about. And then back as you're rotating your your torso and redirecting and so forth. It's a very uh, it's a very relaxing exercise actually, and and highly beneficial for uh, in for creating a more intuitive um, sense of uh, of feel. Uh, one of the things that uh, Lee led into after this was the discussion on joints. Joints. And I'm going to Todd with that. Todd, why don't we just address that right now? Okay. So I'm not sure where you want to go with this, but I think I knew, I know. So we'll, and when we talk about joints and we talk about body mechanics, we can't talk about any of it without addressing the white elephant in the room, which is levers and leverage. And the fact that they all function uh, to some degree or extent in the levers and leverage world. Every joint that you have in your body has or employs a lever or two or three compound levers. Um, so if, if we better understand, which goes back to the lone kimono conversation, you know, if I understand that, that the strength of the joint is this way instead of this way, 
as a result of understanding where the bands that pull and the bands that push and what crosses and what doesn't cross, where the axis is, the lever is, the fulcrum, the effort and the load, then I can then I can be more effective in my application of any punch, strike, block, kick, poke, or whatever through the uh, greater understanding of those levers and leverage and, and how they function at each joint because not all joints are equal. T Marty, your thoughts. Well, I, I totally agree with Mr. Durgan on that. And, and I like the idea of learning how to utilize the levers and leverages. And, and I get a lot of that in the Salat, which if you can incorporate that into your, your Kempo, it puts your Kempo on steroids. And, and I defy somebody to, to tell me not. There's in, in your application, when you start adding into the, uh, the Salat into the Kempo, it starts working it in such a way that we utilize the motions we have, but we take it to another level to get full utilization out of it. Like if we did a crossover. I mean, we, we do crossovers into breaks and, and a lot of other type uh, actions in the Salat world more so than we do in Kempo. Although we do have the same type of motion there, but we're looking at it from a different type of application. And, and in the slot world, there's no tapping out. I mean, once you get that joint manipulated, it's generally broken before the guy hits the ground. It, it's that effective. So I, I like the idea and the concept of utilizing levers to a higher well, level. If that's the case, how do you train with your students without breaking bones? <laughs> Easy. You, you take it slow enough so you start feeling the motion, and that's part of it. When I said earlier in the conversation, you know, when you start learning how to read a person, that doesn't mean that you can't read them by Braille. So when you start feeling energy and you start understanding the flow, and that's what Mr. Durgan was talking about also with the push hand. I, I, I was in a, I got invited over to a, a, a Shotokan school one time from Mr. Robert Halliburton, and he had Kanazana, Kana, Kanazama Sensei there, and he wanted me to do push hand with him. That guy was amazing from his Shotokan to his Tai Chi. And, and I was thoroughly impressed with them. They learned how to flow and they, they wanted the, that softness into their Shotokan so they get a better feel of it. And that goes into Bruce Lee, be like water. You know, people utilize that term, but we don't really apply it like it should. And keeping our fluidity, fluidity going, yeah, can you hear me? Keeping our fluidity going and accenting the portions that we want. You know, that's a, another level of, of uh, body mechanics, I believe.